Good morning, everyone. My name is Alison Kitson, and as you expected, um, I should have been in Tampa, Florida with you, celebrating the second International Conference and Practice Facilitation. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond my control, I'm here in sunny South Australia and uh, very glad that I can at least c connect with you virtually. As you know, I'm going to be talking about what is this thing called facilitation. But first, uh, what I want to do is tell you a bit about Flinders University. Flinders is named after Matthew Flinders, and he was one of the first Europeans to circumnavigate Australia and South Australia in the middle bottom, as I call it, is where uh, Flinders University is situated. Flinders University is also situated on the lands of the Ghana people. And the Ghana people are the traditional owners of the lands that Flinders and all of South Australia are of all of Adelaide is, is situated on. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future of the lands upon which we inhabit. So I would like to acknowledge Liz Lynch, Adrian Young, Alison Mudge, Sarah Hunt Hunter, Jill Harvey and Prue McRae, who uh, a couple of weeks ago we were uh, running a KT workshop here in Adelaide and uh, several of the slides that I'll be sharing with you today uh, are again contributed by this team. Given the uh, elements of the of the metaphor of building, I thought I would use um, something that probably we're all pretty experienced and familiar with. Remember that time that you wanted to build an extension or decking onto the back of your house. Um, it isn't just enough to get uh, the, the materials because uh, who knows what we'll be able to create. And if we don't have plans, then sometimes even our best intentions will uh, result in something less than perfect. Indeed, uh, today, uh, what I want to do is sort of maybe suggest that practice facilitation or the way that you guys are working with your practice environments is a bit like being builders. We're the builders who construct the buildings, who make things better, who put extensions on. And you know what, if we don't have plans, if we don't have ways of understanding how we're constructing things, then we might end up with something that we none of us really wanted. So what I'm going to do today is really uh, go bring you through a journey of the sorts of things we need to put in our toolkit in order to be able to build something that is both sustainable and is fit for purpose. And even though we might not think things like theories or frameworks or models are um, practical, uh, I would la like you to consider, would you ever build an extension to your house without a plan? Or would you just pull in somebody off the street and say, hey, you're a builder, come and build me something? No, you would never do it. So why would we think of not using plans or theories or ideas about how we can improve service? So what I'm going to do is tell you something about uh, uh, work that we have been doing as a team. Because working with clinicians, as you know, um, usually we're very practical, pragmatic people and we don't like all this highfalutin stuff about, oh, you have to think about it, what model are you using? We just want to get on and solve the problem. But working with clinicians like Alison Mudge and Adrian Young, who are physicians and occupational therapists and speech therapists and uh, dietitians, what we realize is that you can't actually get change happening unless you understand some of the underlying ways that we can make that change happen, change attitudes, change behavior, change systems. So the first thing is, what do we mean by these different terms? Um, uh, framework, theory, or model. Does it matter uh, whether we use one or the other? And are they the same or different? So what we know is that theories are things that explain why things happen. They also can predict how and why relationships between certain things work together, whereas models uh, actually describe the focus and explain how specific things work together. And they are the sort of things that make theories work in practice. 
whereas a framework describes the whole thing. So again, if you think of um, building a house, the whole plans would be like the framework. And uh, the model would be how you would organize your bathroom or your ensuite. And the theories behind it are the theories that the architect or the people who built uh, the plans would have to use to be able to make the house stay, stand up. So that's the sort of way that we think about these things. In uh, knowledge translation or in um, practice facilitation or in implementation science, whatever term you choose to use, um, there are a, a range of, of uh, theories or frameworks that we can use. So, uh, and you may, may be familiar with these. And again, I'm just going to go through these very, very quickly so that you'll get a sense of the things that are the same and the things that are di slightly different and then how you can put them all together. So the first is the knowledge to action framework. The second, which I'll be talking a bit more about, is the Paris or the iParis framework. Then there's the consolidated framework for implementation research, or CIFR as it's called, the theoretical domains framework, TDF, the normalization process theory, NPT, and then REAM. And I hope you're not losing the will to live, thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to go through all these theories. My job is to make it um, interesting and attractive for you. So the Knowledge to Action Framework, first developed by Ian Graham and colleagues in Canada. And as you can see from the diagram, the little uh, triangle in the middle is the sort of reflects how knowledge is generated and then goes down through a funnel where it hits the point of action. And at that point of action where it, it, it jumps from being a piece of information to something that people can use to change, to improve, to, to solve a problem, is where the action cycle comes. Now, Ian and colleagues developed this, um, this model from um, a review of 31 different uh, action or change theories. So it is pretty well uh, established in terms of the evidence base for this. And again, we know that uh, for many clinicians, uh, both in acute care or primary care, this is um, a model that people can use. The second one is the Integrated Promoting Action on Research Implementation in Health Services, or IPARIS. And again, this is the one that myself and colleagues, uh, Jill Harvey and Brendan McCormick, first developed in the late 1990s. And it was developed based on practical experience um, of ourselves and uh, a number of research teams and clinic clinical teams that we were working with. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of it now because I'll be touching that later on. So I'll go on to the third one, which is called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR. Now, this was developed by uh, Laura Damschroeder and colleagues at the Veterans Affairs. And again, it was developed by pulling together a lot of the work that was uh, starting to emerge around um, uh, how people were trying to get their plans sorted for implementing new ideas or new evidence into practice. And the particular uh, focus of this tool is on how you evaluate and how you demonstrate that the changes that you wanted to uh, make happen have actually happened. And they identified five domains um, in their framework. Um, the intervention characteristics. So again, what is it that you're trying to put into practice? And uh, is it going to be acceptable to people? What is the outer setting? So that's like the outer context or the system that you work within. The inner context, which is the, the team, the unit, the, the practice that you're working in. The characteristics of the individuals and then the process. Now, the process I would call how things are facilitated. And uh, the resources, there's a set of resources that are freely available on websites and they include tools, templates and examples. The next one is the theoretical domains framework. And this was developed uh, from a synthesis of psychological behaviour change theories. Um, led by Susan uh, Minchi and colleagues. It really um, focuses on 
um, that important element of um, implementation science or practice facilitation, which is around how do you change people's behaviour. So they pulled together, uh, Minchi and her team, uh, a lot of the evidence around the motivational factors, the things that help people change what they do, and they've put this into um, a, a framework. And you can see that the illustration is that in the spinning wheel, there are different elements that you put together, a bit like a bullseye. If you get the things all lining up together, uh, there's more likelihood that you will be successful. It largely focuses on the behavior of individuals as opposed to the wider context in which implementation occurs. So again, if you're interested in the behavior change of the people you're working with, this is a model that uh, would be helpful or a framework that would be helpful for you. Moving on to uh, another theory called the normalization process theory. Uh, this was developed by Carl May and colleagues based on uh, action uh, uh, science and agency. So basically as a sociological uh, construct, they argue that individuals and groups must work collectively to implement new ideas. And that uh, change occurs through coherence. In other words, um, does it make sense to people? Are they, do they get it? And if they get it, do they want to sort of then all work together, cognitively participating in the change? And if they, if it makes sense to them, if they get it, then they can uh, start to make the actions that are needed to make the change. And then they will reflect on the impact that that's having. So coherence, cognitive participation, collective action, reflexive monitoring are all the things that reflect this theory. Um, importantly, uh, May and colleagues would argue that uh, you have to sort of, the new things that you're putting into practice, you have to be able to make them um, become almost like the routine practice, like the new norm. And they would argue that you won't get spread or sustainability unless people adopt and internalize the new ideas that they're working with. Uh, the final one that I just want to touch on, and again, many of you may be familiar with this because it it's, um, comes from the public health domain, is um, called REAIM, and it's uh, reaching the number of individuals, thinking at the effectiveness and the impact on outcomes, how you're going to adopt the new idea, how you're going to maintain it. So these are the uh, elements of that uh, uh, framework. It's probably mostly used for um, almost cataloging what you're trying to do and recording how you've done it, but it sort of leaves the, all that middle stuff a bit of a black box. So does it matter which one you choose? Well, actually, um, Think of the stage of the project, whether you're planning your project, whether you're at the implementation stage, when you're at the evaluation stage. Think of the complexity of what you're trying to uh, introduce. How many individuals are you going to target? How many teams are you targeting? Uh, how much of how many levels in the organization are you trying to change? What is the level of guidance required? Uh, are you trying to interpret and explain difficult concepts or is it pretty straightforward what you're trying to do or is it a mixture of both and how much uh, resources do you have in your toolkit and what's your role in the project implementer researcher or both and finally you just have to be pragmatic make sure that the framework or the model works for you now again you guys you practice facilitators you probably know and I don't need to tell you this that as a, a facilitator, uh, you can see that it is a very important part of um, all of the work that um, goes into actually improving things or introducing new ideas. Uh, but we would argue that facilitation is the active ingredient in the iParis framework, and this is why I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about that. And we also recognize that as facilitators, there will be several roles that you will actually undertake. You'll be a moderator, an observer, an expert, a guide, a coach, a teacher, a team member, and you can be all or any of these in the course of a day. 
What is important, though, is that facilitation, as we define it, is making things easier for others. It's uh, both a process and a role, and it's also something that aligns with complexity thinking and network theory, where agency is king. Now, that means being able to interact in a social situation is what you guys do. And we have to realize that um, our, the worlds that we live in are very complex and complicated, not just physically and structurally, but also the whole range of people that we work with. And these, again, are just illustrations of the sort of level of complexity that you work in. So the Paris framework was first published in 1998, and it uh, was one of the first frameworks that challenged the straight line or the linear uh, way of thinking about evidence-based practice, which meant you get the evidence um, you develop an implementation plan and then it just happens as if it's magic. Well, we know that it's not magic. So what we did was that we developed this uh, formula which really said SI, successful implementation, is a function of the type of evidence you're putting into practice, the context into which you're putting it into, and the way it's facilitated. Uh, breaking these elements up uh, further, we say that evidence is a mixture of research evidence, clinical experience, uh, patient experience, and local evidence that you put into uh, practice. The context relates to resources, cultures, leadership, and the orientation to learning and to evaluation. And the facilitation is both the role of the facilitator and the process of facilitation. We, again, in the early literature, we showed or we used a diagnostic grid which would help people, the facilitators, uh, work out how they would get to the top right-hand quadrant, which really is if you are working in a weak context, so that means where there wasn't good leadership, it was really difficult to, in terms of resources. Um, the culture wasn't good, people uh, didn't get much uh, uh, sort of feedback on their performance. How would you as the facilitator actually try and do something about that? And how would you take people along in order to accept the new evidence or the new piece of information that was happening? So that those are the sorts of ways that we worked on it. Uh, now, we know that over the last 20 years, uh, the Paris framework has been used uh, both in uh, low and uh, middle income countries. It's been used as an implementation program in Vietnam to uh, reduce uh, perinatal mortality. It's been used in many, many uh, primary care areas and also in a lot of acute care areas. And from the feedback that we've got from many, many researchers and clinicians, these were the things that they told us about the framework. First of all, we didn't have a clear understanding of the role of the individual. It lacked a focus on the wider levels of context, so the broader organisational and political dimensions. And it really uh, failed to provide the actual nuts and bolts uh, of the toolkit. How were you actually going to you know, put your extension up and actually where are we going to put the nails in and put the screws in? So uh, this is uh, what a colleague and myself, Jill Harvey, did then in uh, 2015. Uh, we published the book, which was the revised version of the Paris Framework and it's called the Integrated or iParis Framework. Now, the Integrated uh, Framework, again, uses a similar sort of formula, but what you can see is that we've taken uh, facilitation out of the brackets. That means that we're saying facilitation is the active ingredient, and it is the facilitation process or the facilitators in role who have a big influence on the innovation, the I, the, the uh, recipients, the people who are in receipt of the new ideas and the context. So we've further uh, outlined these elements. So you can see that within innovation, we now have a number uh, of dimensions or sub-elements that we're developing um, where the knowledge comes from, the clarity of that uh, knowledge how it fits with people's existing understanding, how new or how novel it is. Are they going to use it? Uh, is it going to help them if they're going to use it? Can they just 
test a bit out before they have to adopt it whole scale? And can they see the difference that it's going to make? Equally, in terms of the recipients, now remember Minchie's uh, theory, uh, theoretical domains framework. This would be the sort of area where you would really want to understand this. The motivation of the people, the individuals, the teams, the groups. Um, what are their values, their beliefs? What goals do they have, individual, corporate, team? Um, are, do they have the right skills and knowledge for this new intervention? Do they have the time, the inclination, the support? Who are the people who are going to influence and, and talk to the, the skeptics or the cynics, the people who really don't want to see change at all? How good is the teamwork? Uh, how does information generally get uh, moved around these systems? Is it a learning environment? Uh, who holds the power and what are the boundaries like? Are they hard? Or are they easy to get through? And if you didn't think that was enough to sort of put into your toolkit or to add to your plan, then again, the iParis framework identified three levels of context that you had to consider. The inner context, the local level, the outer context, which is the broader organizational context, and then the, um, the, the, the political, uh, environmental, policy, financial. So these are the things that we need to consider. And what we did in the book was to say that as uh, a facilitator or what the facilitator focuses on is that external context, the inner context, both at organizational level and at unit level. In terms of your practice, it would be um, the uh, inner context would be the local practice. But if you were part of a practice network, then that would be your inner context organization. And then the external context is probably your state or your federal laws. And again, the red describes what skills the facilitator needs. I've actually now just explained and rapid, rapidly gone through what the iParis framework is like. For those of you who are just being exposed to it in the first time, uh, what it is important to remember is that facilitation is the active ingredient. Ingredient we've identified successful implementation is the ability of the facilitator to combine the innovation with the um, uh, recipients and then the different levels of context. What we're now going to do in this last section of the talk is to talk about getting on with the job, something about how we can build things that last. Again, what we've been talking about is that you as the practice facilitator really um, have the, the plan and the responsibility of trying to pull the plan together. And again, you probably don't, meet, don't need me to tell you about the importance of the, of the objectives, the people that you're working with who will be learning new things, the environment, um, how they psychologically, socially, emotionally are going to respond to all of that and you in your role as facilitator. Things that you also might want to think about whenever you're embarking on a, a new project is, um, are you at the planning stage? Uh, do you want to know how that, the plan that you're developing is going to help you do a diagnostic? Uh, do you want the plan to also to help you uh, work out how you're going to implement the new ideas? And equally, at the end of it, how you're going to uh, evaluate uh, whether it worked or not. Did you actually do what you wanted to do? Uh, or do you want to, it to do all of those? Obviously, if you wanted to do all of them, it's going to be a bigger plan than if you just wanted to do one bit or the other. So again, going back to the iParis framework and again, just helping you to understand the way that uh, Jill Harvey and I have thought about how we make a framework uh, practical so that it can become part of your toolkit. These are some of the questions that we would be encouraging you to ask yourself or to ask some of the stakeholders that you will be working with as you introduce a new innovation into your, into your primary care practice. So uh, you would change the statements to questions. So what is the underlying evidence base? Is the evidence in an easy, accessible and usable form? How much novelty does it introduce? Does it offer an advantage over current practice? 
could it be tested on a small scale? Again, these were the dimensions that you have previously seen as elements of the iParis framework. They've been turned into questions so that you can use that to generate conversations. Equally, uh, the characteristics of the recipients. Um, what is their motivational level? Do they see the innovation as valuable and worthwhile? Is it consistent with their existing values and beliefs? Is there a shared view? Uh, do they have the knowledge, skills, resources and support needed to in introduce the innovation? And are there local opinion leaders uh, there to support them? I think you're all getting the idea now, aren't you, that we're actually turning each of the elements that we identified through uh, the theoretically derived elements of the iParis framework from a set of statements to a set of questions. So you can see, as you can see on this slide, um, these are questions that we would ask um, of the local context. And again, there would be no surprises. You would be familiar with the importance of informal leaders um, calibrating the culture, um, past experience of innovation, uh, the commitment to ongoing learning and evaluation, and how what sort of mechanisms are in place to embed changes into routine practice. The organisational context, again, we have a lot of evidence that shows us that if leaders, uh, middle managers, senior managers, senior executives are not on board, don't understand and don't prioritise the things that we are doing at local level, then there's no real uh, expectation or real sort of chance that things will either be embedded, normalised, routinized and then therefore sustained. So these are the things that you would be looking at in your inner context. And your outer context are the things that possibly um, we might often complain about, but we certainly don't feel that we are in a, in a position to influence. But yet we do have to have strategies to influence the wider and the outer context. And because we do know that such um, elements as um, external drivers, such as incentives, regulatory free frameworks, payment systems within our health systems will either uh, create an incentive for us to change or will be significantly disincentives for us. Um, think of the Choosing Wisely campaign that has gone across all of America and is now in Australia. That is a good example of, of a national federal initiative that is trying to change behaviour at local level. Again, um, some of you might find this um, diagram reassuring because that tells you the complexity that you work in as practice facilitators. Others might think we're just making it overcomplicated. But if I tell you that we know from research that it's only around 20% of any innovation or any new implementation project that is successful in the way that it is designed, we know that um, complexity is a thing that is the challenging element in any sort of practice change. To understand that complexity, to work with it rather than against it, to be a bit of a, a, a sort of a white rafter is the sort of way that we get through the, the churn of organisational change. And what would be in your toolkit? So think of that last slide, and that's the slide that really is the, um, the sort of hard wiring, the mental map that you would be carrying along with you. But what other people would see coming out of your toolkit would be um, these four interactive and dynamic quadrants. So how do you um, engage and clarify what the problem is? How do you get stakeholders together? How do you collect the data that helps everyone understand what it is that you need to do? How do you start to pull together what you're going to do and how you're going to do it? And then how do you um, demonstrate that you've done what you want to do? Put in a simple package like that, then it, it's a bit more palatable. The other thing that uh, we need to identify is that uh, there's been quite a bit of work that's been done pulling together the whole range of different implementation strategies that are currently being used across a lot of health and other systems. 
And uh, Tom Waltz and colleagues in 2015 actually produced a really helpful um, uh, nomenclature or a list of all of the different sorts of uh, strategies that people use to uh, implement new ideas into practice. You can see that the ones that are most commonly used are those that relate to education and to a, um, sort of changing opinion. But, you know, don't be surprised to see that there's a whole range of other things that we can do. So again, we're starting to generate the evidence of the things that you can put into your toolkit. We're generating the plans that help you understand what you have to think about. And now the real trick is to put those two things together and not just put them together in a, in a sort of a, an ad hoc or sort of um, um, sort of casual way, but it's actually trying to do it in a systematic way that we ourselves can start to build that body of knowledge and be able to move forward. The other thing I just want to point out is that we ourselves as facilitators are on a journey. So if you are a novice or beginner facilitator, you will need to follow the plan. You'll need to have other people helping you like experienced facilitators or expert facilitators to guide and mentor you to know which, which bits of the framework that you need to use, which bits of the um, implementation strategies you can use and how do you put those together so that you're actually creating something that looks like uh, a nice extension onto a house rather than something that looks a bit crazy and is about to fall down. How will we know it, it uh, will make a difference to us? Well, these are the sorts of questions that we will constantly be asking ourselves. Did we implement the knowledge or the evidence? Uh, did we get the improvements in practice that we wanted? Did we improve the system? Did we improve health outcomes? Did we improve patient experiences? Did we make or did we make things worse? These it's important to to think about these sorts of process evaluations alongside local monitoring and indeed that feedback and reflection. So these reflective conversations are again the bedrock of good practice facilitation, a great set of skills to have, and I'm sure that over the next couple of days you will be using that. Um, process and those reflective conversations. But just to close on a, an example from my own experience, um, the, the way that we have been able to put um, a large project together testing two types of facilitation. One was um, uh, based on audit and feedback and more of a quality improvement process and the other was more related to um, um, social um, emancipatory uh, sort of social theory uh, and that was really using an individual, the individual facilitator as the critical friend and helping people move forward. So this project called Facilitating Implementation of Research Evidence or the FAR project uh, was undertaken in four European countries across 26 different aged care facilities. And the thing that we were trying to implement was um, adherence to continence guidelines. So older people in care homes, in continent, what were the carers doing to uh, adhere to the best practice guidelines? What we found was uh, in doing a randomised control trial across those 24 sites um, and testing the two different types of facilitation intervention against the control, which was basically giving um, six health facilities uh, the guidelines, we actually found there was no significant difference. So how did we uh, understand that? Well, the process evaluation, which was undertaken alongside the randomised control trial, began to look at the context and began to unpick what it was that was happening in the different uh, uh, environments in those four countries, in those uh, 24 different uh, environments in all of those different contexts. So we were able to explain why things didn't work. And then finally, uh, what we also uh, were able to do was actually the expert facilitators and myself and Jill Harvey 
were the two expert facilitators that actually led the um, facilitation arm that was based on quality improvement methodology. We were able to demonstrate or reflect using the evidence that we'd picked up at the points where we were um, virtually facilitating our um, uh, novice facilitators, how we knew that things were starting to sort of not go the way in the direction that we wanted them to go. But because we were constrained by the um, methodology of the randomised control trial, big debates about fidelity, big debates about how could we start to uh, moderate and monitor and change and adopt what we knew was starting to happen, both in the context and with the local facilitators. And we weren't able to do that. So whilst this um, on face value would show that facilitation did not work, we uh, are able to explain that because of the complexity of the context of the innovation of the recipients um, that, and the, the novelty and the novice nature, the beginning, the beginning facilitators didn't have the experience or capability to actually do the job that they were required to do. So this um, really helps you understand that facilitation is an incredibly important thing. Um, I would say in closing that it provides a plan it's flexible, it survives all weathers, it's environmentally friendly in that it's not throwing and dumping more uh, guidelines onto you, it's actually conducting conversations and building relationships, it's sustainable, and I would say it works anywhere. If you like this, if you like the iParis uh, framework, then why don't you come to the workshop that is being run by my colleagues um, Sarah Hunter and Bo Kim, and it's all about how we mobilise the integrated promoting action on research implementation in health services, practical tools to make framework informed implementation and facilitation easier, and in my view, much more successful. Thank you, Florida. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't interact with you. Uh, I've read your uh, program. It sounds absolutely wonderful. I'm absolutely delighted that my colleague Sarah Hunter, Sarah waved to everybody uh, that Sarah Hunter is in the audience and she will be bringing back, I'm sure, all the love from Florida. So have a wonderful time. Uh, hello to Joanne Kirchner. Hello to Melinda. Um, I look forward to uh, coming to your uh, 2019 event. Count me in. Um, so what we want to do is take some time, if possible, to shift to the um, slide I have up here. Can we shift to this monitor? And what I, what I want to ask first is raise your hand if you've heard of the iParis framework before. Okay, so there's a lot then to uh, digest, right? How about let's do another thing. Uh, thumbs up if you like frameworks, if you're neutral, and if you're maybe a little skeptical. That's good, so a lot, some thumbs, I'm not seeing any thumbs down, strong thumbs down. Some strong thumbs up over here where Sarah is at. So um, what I, what I wanna do actually is um, take a little time for people to debrief. So what I'm going to ask you to do um, is to just take a minute for yourself, and I want you to reflect on some questions that I'm going to put up on the next slide. And then what we'll have the opportunity to do is just at the tables you're at now to talk with the partner next to you. Um, and then we might let some uh, group sharing happen. We want to make sure to end um, right at about 10.50 because we want to make sure people are able to find the locations for the next set of talks that happen at 11. If you are giving a presentation today, um, hopefully you have that presentation on a flash drive. Just go to your room early. There's gonna be somebody there who should be hosting the session and you can download your presentation um, and, and then give it right from there. So the questions I want you to think about are these. So just by yourself at first, take about uh, a few minutes and think about what elements of the model resonate with your experience with facilitation. Okay. 
And then why or why not? Let's get it to the appropriate formatting. Um, how might you apply what you heard to your own work? And then what additional training or what additional questions might you have relating to Dr. Kitson's model, given that this was the first time for many people? So just take a few minutes and maybe jot down some notes to yourself. So for the introverts in the room, which is why we have take a few minutes to, to take some notes by yourself. So let's take about five minutes, maybe three if you start talking, I'll break in early. But take a, take a few minutes just to think to yourself about these questions before engaging with your partners at the table.
hoo, hoo. You should be taking notes. Thank you, Connie, for that uh, suggestion for a crowd getter. Um, I like that in the spirit of facilitation, we had a plan and we are responding to what you guys did. So um, thank you for taking some time to answer these questions. What I wanna do is kind of have the opportunity to go around the room and see if there's anything that somebody wants to share, either in response to the prompts up here. I know some people uh, actually had other ways they were approaching their conversation. So I'm wondering based on, on that presentation, maybe we'll just start. Um, is there anybody who has something they wanna share with the group about how the model either resonated with them or, or didn't? Raise your hand if you're interested in having me come to your table. Yes, thank you. Some wonderful, wonderful pre-work, so thank you for uh, standing up. I share anyhow all the time in our state, so they're all laughing, they know me. Hi, I'm Terry Roberts. I'm with the North Carolina AHEC system, which is our allied health education centers. All of our states have AHECs, but North Carolina is the largest. So what we immediately did is practice facilitators, we're not researchers, although my neck of the woods has a big research department, um, and UNC Chapel Hill does, but um, they, we're, we're sort of held away from research so as we can just be intuitive and get our work done. Uh, one of the things we found out was that, wow, we didn't realize what we do is so complicated. Um, we've been doing it so long, it's, they're nodding, it's just absolutely intuitive and it's kind of weird that we're studied, you know? Um, so immediately we took some three elements out of the plenary and I turned to Jessica and I said, wow, you did a great job last week. Uh, we're having to grow our program, so if anybody's a PF looking for jobs, North Carolina's growing. Um, we have money, and uh, <laughs> so just a shout out, and we've been constantly employed for going on 10 years, so there you go. One job's on the beach, Wilmington, no snow. All right, that being said, uh, we, she immediately had applied a lot of the models inside the job description, and she was sharing that the recruiter called her and said, now, can you please explain to me what these people do? I don't know how to recruit. So it was, it was just strange to suddenly see it from Australia, shout out, that in North Carolina, wow, we didn't know, but we were following the models. So um, I just, that's, we just take it from here and go down to there. There's a really, I think, interesting time in practice facilitation, and I think it parallels some of the movement in evidence-based medicine, where I think early on, you know, you had clinicians that were treating and doing things based on intuition, and I think a lot of facilitators also are good at their work based on intuition, but we, I think, also have an opportunity to help think about how do we break that down, and how do we... Um, devise ways to maybe train people or to clearly communicate about how we uh, match certain activities that we do with context in a more systematic way. So I think part of the beauty of having frameworks is it helps give us a way to um, bridge across these different programs, those who tend to be doing and, and getting things done, and those who maybe are slower thinkers, more meticulous thinkers like researchers who really wanna uh, devise and understand why things happen. Um, what about some other groups? Yeah. Hi, hello, my name is Mike Schumann. I come from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, something that I think came up with a few people that we mentioned here was about the relationships with practices and how, you know, I think frameworks are very helpful um, and also uh, being flexible is very helpful. But bottom line, you have to understand, you know, who you're working with and some of our practices in the city we've been working with since like 2005 on all kinds of other stuff. We helped subsidize their electronic health records early on as part of extension center work. Um, and having that history and relationships and understanding uh, where to intervene, like at what level and how, and how to go around people without going over their heads and stuff like that, I think is, is really important to this as well. And it came up with a few people here. So talk to Michael if you wanna get some strategies on how to socially appropriately uh, get your agenda higher up on the radar, I think, which is something we hear about a lot. 
Uh, another framework that isn't, wasn't mentioned is the dynamic sustainability framework, which I think brings up some of those things. It's basically this idea that in addition to the IPARIS, it's an iterative process over time. So let's say you maybe do the initial work when you get introduced to a practice. Those contexts, those recipients are often constantly changing, and so it builds in more complexity and the opportunity to actually reassess and to build on what you've accomplished in the past to move an innovation forward. Joanne, you might get to be our final word for this session, so. I can save it and I can, if, if you want, I could tell it tomorrow, okay. Um, I'm actually gonna speak to you guys tomorrow about all sorts of tools you can use that are based on the iParis framework, but I've gotta tell my story about um, me and frameworks. Um, I don't do frameworks. I don't like conceptual models. You know, I'm a simple-minded MD. And so, um, much like North Carolina, we developed a program to implement um, integrated mental health and primary care um, at a network level across, eight, um, some are part of eight different states in 13 different settings, rural, urban, everything, and by golly, it worked. So, um, the research arm of the VA said, you need to evaluate this. And I said, great, so I got my team together, you know, and they, they Mona Ritchie and Jeff Curran said, Okay, what's your framework? I said, I don't do frameworks. I'm a simple-minded MD. And um, they said, you are not gonna get this grant unless you have a framework. I said, I don't do frameworks. Well, that went on for about three weeks. And so then after a meeting, I went back to my office and there was a stack of manuscripts. You think Allison had a list. Man, I had every manuscript of every framework known to man. And the little note said, pick a framework. <laughs> So I start going through, th that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't make any sense, and I found Paris. And I said, by God, that's what I did, that's what we did to change care. So now, I love Paris. I hate frameworks, but <laughs> I love Paris. So I, I think Joanne, uh, She's also a very successful researcher, right? So like I said, find your friends. If you're a facilitator, find your friends like Joanne. I think frameworks are intimidating and there are many. I think in the last review, there's like a DNI frameworks website that maybe has over a hundred options you can choose from. But the key is to find the one that aligns with what you're doing and then help use that to get deeper insight uh, into the work you're doing. I think we had one more hand over here. Um, we have a minute, and then I'll close up. So tell me what you want to know. So my name is Megan Doran. I'm from Health Quality Innovators, and we're a QIO and a PTN, um, and also do some research as well. And just wanted to quickly say that a lot of the work that we do, we're going into practices as practice facilitators, and we're asking people to do something really hard, which is look at themselves critically and look at their data and look at their processes and make changes and frameworks really allow us to look critically at our own processes and our own data and be able to conceptualize that as well. Beautiful. So this has been a, a wonderful starting session. We do now go to some of the uh, breakouts and um, as you know the rooms are located there and then three along this wall and we actually learned that the other meeting room, Jolt, is also on this floor can you tell us where it's located? It's right around the corner that way, room one. So everything is just around here. You will find them. So if you're giving a presentation, go now, get your stuff uploaded. And if you are attendee, go enjoy. Thanks so much. <laughs>